Would you please go ahead for six minutes? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, of course, to the Deputy uh, Grand Chief for, for joining us today. And, and that op those opening remarks, I think, already uh, gave us a lot to think about. And uh, I trust, uh, uh, as we move through the questions, that uh, we'll have much more to work with. And uh, I, just let me say it's an honour to be able to uh, um, to speak with you today, uh, representing the riding of Kenora and many, uh, many communities, which, of course, you also uh, represent with uh, your organisation. And um, one of the things you mentioned uh, was the uh, w winter road system, obviously very important uh, for many of the remote communities in my riding. And we know with the changing environment and uh, the warmer winter, sort of every day, but today has been uh, relatively warm uh, in our region, uh, that the, uh, the seasons are shorter, they're expected to be shorter, they're already, um, uh, already causing some significant issues in, in the winter road uh, availability for uh, many of these Northern First Nations. And I have heard uh, recently from some chiefs uh, in my writing that uh, they're actually going to be appealing to the federal government to uh, help, uh, hopefully uh, get some support to ensure that the maintenance of those, uh, that winter road system um, uh, can be, it can be maintained and that it can be optimized, uh, especially given the shorter season um, that they have. Uh, because of course, as you know, um, if the goods aren't being uh, driven up, if food's not being uh, brought up through the road system, it's it's being flown in at a much higher cost. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more um, to the importance of that winter road system and ensuring that uh, it's as, as viable as possible uh, for those remote communities. You're on mute. Uh... Open your mic, Grant, Deputy Grand Chief. There. All right. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's true that um, you know the the winter road network that we have in our territory is is vital to um, you know the delivery of uh, uh, goods and uh, to the community, especially uh, fuel. Um, you know, in, in my experience, um, when I was working for, for NAN as a, a staff member um, about 10 years ago, um, we had a meeting with, um, I think it was the ADM for uh, INAC at the time, and um, uh, many of our communities came to uh, our office and we met with them, and they were concerned that uh, they weren't going to be able to fly the fuel in. Um, that they needed for for year-round um, supply for energy for the the community, and um, during that meeting, um, they had mentioned that you know just to fly in the fuel costs uh, up to uh, half a million to a million dollars. So they really wanted to avoid you know those kind of costs because what happens when uh, a community um, doesn't get all the fuel that they need, they have to fly it in. And then when that happens, uh, a lot of the communities have to pay for it out of their own pocket through uh, other um, maybe programs, whatnot within the community. And that puts a, a financial strain on you know, the, the planning of um, where that money should um, have, have actually been, been used. So <clears throat> when, when that happens as well, you know, it, it creates even more strain on the first station because then you know, the, the communities only have so much money um, that they're provided with to run these programs and services, et cetera. And then when um, costs like, like say, not getting enough fuel uh, up to the community because of the winter road happens, then it puts more strain. So, you know, it, it just creates, like I'm just using fuel as an example because of my experience in that, that situation. So, you know, with um, when when the winter roads, um, you know, the, it plays such a an important role in in that. Um, I know um, when uh, when the winter roads are are set up, um, even uh, on uh, the James Bay coast, you know, a lot of uh, communities during the, the winter road season they go down south to do a lot of their shopping. You know, to they they buy in bulk. I know a lot of people take uh, trucks and just fill them up, you know, with basic staples too, like uh, say toilet paper, for example. 
you know, so there's uh, definitely, um, I would say, a need. Our communities are, are looking for, you know, cheaper uh, products and, and uh, you know, that, uh, that they use day to day, you know, that, um, you know, like say people living in an urban area um, get to enjoy every day. You know, that's something that uh, people in urban areas don't really need to think about. You know? right. So I, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Chair, I hope I have time for one more. Well, you've got about a half a minute. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a minute and a half. How's okay. that? Okay. <laughs> that, that? That's more than generous. Thank okay. you. I, uh, <laughs> and I'll just ask quickly, um, you also mentioned uh, the, the fact that there's uh, obviously a lot of unhealthy foods uh, uh, that are being brought to these communities. It's not really a focus from the government on uh, supporting traditional uh, harvesting. I'm just wondering if you could go into a bit more details on uh, some of the programs or some of the ways that we might be able uh, to help assist uh, with culturally appropriate and traditional foods. Right. Um, there is a harvester support grant that has been made available. Um, I think um, what we need to do is create more um, programs and services that um, you know, that encourages our people to be more out on the land, um, you know, because the, the way that it is right now, um, you know, a lot of people can't afford to uh, go out on the land. Um, it's, it's, it's starting to become a luxury, you know, even though a lot of our people are, are craving for it and they're asking for it, you know. And um, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, um, about um, a program that uh, the community started in uh, Moose Cree First Station. That's in uh, Moose Factory. Um, it's, it's a program called uh, Project George. And it's where a couple of community members got together. Uh, one of them was the former deputy chief, um, who actually I've, I've known for quite some time. And, um, you know, what he does is he, he takes kids, youth, out onto the land. Um, mainly um, youth at risk. And, um, you know, he teaches them you know, a lot about uh, our culture and our ways and our traditions. And um, he told me one time that uh, he hadn't heard from this kid. And um, he went to his house and um, he said, pack your things, we're going out to the bush. We're going out for... Uh, couple of days and that kid said that was he was hesitant at first he said I don't I don't want to go you know I don't feel like going and then uh, that guy was really persistent he said come on let's just go let's, let's go you'll we'll have a good time so the kid you know gave in and went and um, with a group of other kids and that that uh, that kid that um, that was hesitant uh, told the former deputy chief of Moose Cree that you know, if, if he didn't come and take him out to the land that day, he would have committed suicide that night. So, you know, that's just an example of, I guess, uh, you know, that our, our people are craving, you know, to go back out on the land. And it's just one way or another, you know, a lot of families just can't afford it, you know, and, and there's, there's a lot that's, um, that's, uh, I would say, that's being lost, that's not passed down the way that it used to be, you know? Like, uh, Chief, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, <clears throat> that's right. We're way over on that 